So in any event, enough about drug dealing. Um, this is a trade I put on um, uh, a few, um, just a few years ago. And um, the company's called Celadon. It, Operator board as it was, was called Celadon. They're, they're gone now, so easy come, easy go. It had about a 400 million market cap, and they had one drug. It was uh, called Mitocar. It's a, it's a gene therapy, so I don't know how many people here, any medical, anyone interested in medicine and science? Mm -hmm. All right, enough people. Um, it's, a, it's an AV1 <laughs> vector. It's a, that's a, a viral therapy, so the idea is that the virus will infect your cells and in, insert its so-called transgene, which is supposed to be therapeutic. Um, this has not been a good strategy for, for drug development. It, it will have its day in, with, in time, but um, in general, gene therapy has been a pretty big disappointment. And so um, what was amazing, though, is this company had phase two data where the, they called the trial QP1. They had an 80% reduction in mortality, which sounds pretty good. Um, and you think to yourself, well, in phase three, even if it's half of that, right, 40% reduction in mortality, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the truth was a little bit different, so um, to make a long story short, I, I shorted the stock, and, and you can guess what happened. But the, the interesting part was sort of how I approached it um, logically. And when I invest, I, I try to be, at least as I've matured as an investor, um, and wasn't a riskaholic playing NASDAQ Nintendo, is what I call it, um, you know, clicking, you want to play League of Legends, that's a better place to exert your clicking energy on than, than, than the NASDAQ, <laughs> Goldman Sachs. Um, but again, I, I was young, and mistakes are made, but you learn from them, and again, as long as I think you, you own them, and you make things right in the end, I think that's, that's sort of the philosophy I have. Um, very embarrassing, would have normally killed anybody's career, but um, I kept fighting and ended up doing just fine. Um, so anyway, whenever there's dependent events, separate independent events that, re that require, in other words, are the, the outcome is dependent on those events, um, you can actually multiply the probability of those events and arrive at a final probability. So if three things need to happen for something to work, I need to, event A, event B, and event C all need to happen, and they're all independent of each other, and there's a 10% chance that one happens, there's a 10% chance another happens, and there's a 50% chance, say, another happens. The probability that all of those will happen is 0.5%. And the crazy thing about, you know, I guess, human nature is that it, it often becomes, um, that, that isn't as obvious. You look at people and say, oh, this has a chance to work. But then when you study it, say, there's actually no chance this works. And I've used that um, dynamic several times, and I'll give you two examples. So Celadon was one. And some people say, well, how do you do this? I only find one or two of these a year at best. Um, in fact, I haven't found one since the second one I'll show you. But that could be for other reasons. Um, this, this one was one I found. I found two in 2015. And so I um, made this trade. Um, there, there were three events that sort of needed to happen. The first was that the, the and, and again, not a lot of this is rocket science. You know, uh, so much of it is just um, very much logical. The drug has to go into the cell it's supposed to fix, right? That, that seems to make sense for it to work. The drug has got to get there, right? So we studied the data um, that, that uh, was relevant to that, and the drug wasn't getting in there. For a drug to work, it's got to jam itself into the tissue that, that yeah, it needs to be in. And the reason that, that wasn't working is the AV1 serotype um, transfects the liver way more than transfects the heart. We looked at the data and we realized there was almost no transfection, in other words, the gene persisting in the cell. And that was surprising. That alone should be enough to short the stock, right? There's no way that you could have, but how do you explain Cupid 1? How do they get 80% mortality difference? Well, that should scare you if you're a short seller. I mean, if you saw that, the stock would go from 20 to 200, and then you would really owe the bank a lot of money. So I had to explain that, and I looked at that, and what I realized was the patients in Cupid 1 who were in the placebo group, um, they were really, really sick. They had an injection fraction of 15, which is very close to death. The patients in the, in the drug arm had an injection fraction of 30 or 40. They're actually relatively healthy for, for heart failure patients. The, the placebo patients were probably going to die in six months, drug or not. Patients in the, in the drug group were probably going to die in about two years. So when the results came out, it, it didn't really matter if the drug worked or not. Uh, you could actually predict the, the outcome of the trial independent of the drug working or not. So I was able to sort of explain that Cupid 1 succeeded in spite of itself. It wasn't really a test of the drug's efficacy. It was a test of whether or not really sick people die faster than not so sick people, which, which is relatively obvious. Uh, the final thing was that the mechanism had to make sense. So even if the drug gets in the cell, even if the, 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 the phase two study was a fluke, the, the, what the drug does exactly has to make sense. And in this case, we, we felt that it did. So I won't go through that science too much, but this is a calcium 
channel uh, calcium pump, in essence, that allows the sarcomere to contract. And we felt that that was not really that useful. So the stock fell a lot. Um, I don't have any investors, so this was all much of my own money. I don't um, you know, have any hedge fund limited partners or anything. So I made the trade. And you know, for your average hedge fund, this, this, this is like your, I guess for me, it was my own personal hedge fund. It was a fantastic trade. <laughs> Not long later, this thing happened. And um, so one of my hedge fund partners suggested that I, I look into this company. And we, um, we both arrived at the conclusion that this was a good short. So I wrote this 44-page paper. Um, a long time ago, one of my friends said the best way to battle your riskaholic nature is to actually write down why you're doing your investment. When you do that, you get it right. When you don't do that, and you're playing that NASDAQ Nintendo, you're just losing and throwing away money. So over, over years, it took a lot of weeding. I decided to say, I'm going to write down whatever, whenever I'm going to make a, bet, a big bet, I'm going to write it down. So you can actually read it up there. And I'll, I'll, I won't summarize it too much, but this is a company that tried to make a, um, a, a liver that lived outside your body. It was, your, it was for people who have liver failure. You would route your blood into this machine. It would purify it and send it back. This is how dialysis works. In fact, there's a heart-lung machine as well for people who are in coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So this isn't, uh, this isn't a totally crazy idea. It's a little crazy, but it, it's not totally crazy. They put liver cells in the box. I call it the box. And uh, the, uh, your blood goes to the box. You have these liver cells that should be like acting like your own liver and sends your blood back, hopefully detoxified. All right, not so bad. Um, there was a couple of big problems, and I'll show you the data. The data didn't make any sense, and this was the biggest flaw. But the other flaw, I wasn't, I wasn't sure um, just from that. I needed to be really sure. If I'm going to put $20 million up um, to make $20 million, I better be right, because I don't want to lose that money. That money. Um, that's a huge bet for me. Um, so in any event, um, the fact that this thing was designed, I actually think a shoebox would have been a better device. This thing was really poorly designed. You can read the 44 pages to... To, to see why, but I really felt like I had to prove it to myself if I was going to bet a lot. So these are Kaplan-Meier curves. These are survival curves in essence, and I want you to look at the left one first. And what you see should, should alarm you. Um, basically, the, this is a survival curve, and you can see that the liver assist device, ELAD, patients were seemed to do, be, do, be doing better than the control patients. They were surviving longer. Um, in fact, by 60 or 80 days, most of the patients in the control group were dead, which shows you just how much of a need there is for a true liver replacement. Um, this isn't the company that's going to bring us a liver replacement, but you know, you might think like, oh, this, this guy's short selling all the time. Well, I have a lot of long investments, and you know, learning about this has now primed me for if I ever meet a liver assist device company, I know exactly what to do. And I even thought about starting my own because uh, the need is so great, and I learned all the science and technology, and I figure I could, if I'm going to do, I can do it better than they can. Um, so in any event, um, you can see that. The p-value is 0.27, which uh, I know there's a statistics professor here. This is not a robust uh, p-value. The, the chance that the, this effect due to chance is 27%. I don't trust p-value. Any p-value. There he is. Um, I don't trust any p-value. I don't trust any p-value below 0.05. Um, uh, near 0.05. It has to be 0.01 or, or, or less. So what the company did is, okay, so this is a failed trial. You see the capital markers intersect. It makes no sense that these patients all of a sudden get a lot better at day 30 and there's a true separation. In fact, it looks like the control group is better for 30 days. You only take this device for the first seven days. This is a mess. I mean, there's no way this thing works, right? So what they decide to do is go fishing. And they, they decide to look at only the patients who have non-alcoholic acute hepatitis. So they say that, you know what, if you just look at these patients, they did a lot better. And there's early separation and you've got some... You know, subgroup. But the problem is, there is no rational reason to believe that these patients, the non-alcoholics, would do any better than the alcoholics. And we dug really deep into these alcoholic patients. Half of them were alcoholics, um, so it really made no sense. They had a prior history of alcoholism. They weren't alcoholic for that liver failure, but at least from the morphological perspective of is the liver different from the other subgroup, it didn't really make any sense. The p-value still isn't significant. So, so this is a truly a mess, and. We get to this, um, it's something you learn in statistics called Bonferroni correction, and it's pretty technical, but in essence, it means that you can't get 100 bytes at the apple. You can't look and look and look and look for uh, an effect size, and, and if you keep doing that infinitely, you will see an effect size. Um, if you change the primary endpoint, primary endpoint of the Super Bowl is the number of points scored at the end, but if you wanted to make the primary endpoint the number of points scored in the first quarter, I don't know, I think the Falcons would have won the Super Bowl. But you can't just change the rules after the fact. 
And that's what the company tried to do. If you change the rules after the fact, it, you better have a good reason to do so. For instance, you could say, well, there were 10 patients that you know, were put in the wrong arm. They should get the wrong device. Okay, it kind of makes sense to say, all right, let me see who actually got the real stuff and exclude the ones that were maybe accidentally randomized to the wrong device. But that's not what happened here. The company was looking for a reason to continue on. This is, this is very common in business where a CEO wants to have his $300,000, $400,000, dollars salary, and there's no way he can look at this and say, yeah, let's give up. I'm fired. You know, nobody does that. Um, I'd rather spend shareholders' money. Any sucker that's born, born today who believes this, I, I want to spend that guy's money, um, and I'm getting my salary, I'm getting my bonus, I'm getting my perks, I get to tell people I'm a CEO. Yeah. I don't think you should ever want to be that person. Um, so anyway, the, 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 trade, the trade comes out. I'm, um, I'm waiting to, to, it's Friday at 4 o'clock. Options expire this Friday at 4 o'clock. They're worthless on Monday. So we're pretty pissed off. The company we calculated has been holding the data for days and days and days and days. We know that they know that they failed the trial. And it, it didn't matter, though, because if they don't release it by the time our options expire, our options are out. So we were going to lose probably $5 million, but still hold a good chunk of our bet. Um, 4.01 p.m., the stock gets halted. And I just start screaming. Um, and it was... Uh, we, we knew that the result would be bad, but we were so happy that they would announce that the trial would come out before options expiry. And the rules are very esoteric. I think we challenged every single investment bank that day as to what the rules are on how options expire on Friday at 4 o'clock and how much time you have to exercise them uh, after the close. Unbelievably, so the hazard ratio is 1, so the, the drug and the device, the, the device actually, the, 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 the dummy device actually slightly outperformed their brilliant, um, brilliantly designed shoe box, and, and the p-value was 0.9, which is basically, you know, um, an equal randomness. Unbelievably, they had the nerve to say that the less the patients <laughs> who had a different prognostic factor did better than the other patients. So they're doing the same shtick over again and saying that, well, if you just look over here, th this half did really well. The, the dissembling part of that is that the other half did worse than the mean. So you can always have a group that does better than me and a group that does worse than me. It's very disingenuous to say, let me just focus on the one that looks good for me. So these are the sort of tricks that I think drug companies try to play. And again, it's, it's mostly in, in, in hopes of perpetuating a salary or a company and, and not wanting to change your mind about something. Maybe, like I said, the theme about the protesters. So, so you know, those are a few of my investments. I've mostly talked about them, but I'm going to start talking about um, drug pricing. And I, I hope somebody's interested in this. Um, and, and I think a lot of people here, sort of the anti-processors, if you will, have also made up, maybe made up your minds on the situation. And if, if you get to know me, you'll learn that I never make up my mind on anything. I always want to be open-minded. I always want to absorb information and be as sort of even and open-minded as possible. So how do we price drugs? Like I mentioned, before 1990, there was no such thing as a billion-dollar drug. The biggest drug in the world was Zantac, and it barely cleared a billion dollars. This is the antacid that's available at OTC. But finally, around 1990 to 2000, there was this big explosion. There are, there are drugs like Plavix, Lipitor, Zyprexa, Prozac, and endless more, Risperdal, uh, et cetera, Zoloft, that sold billions of dollars. Claritin was a big one. And this came from just more sophisticated um, medicinal chemistry and, and more sophisticated biology. And we, there was a renaissance. But as you may notice, all of these drugs are for big mass market conditions. There's like one company here in Cambridge, uh, Kendall Square, I actually re rented their office when they moved out. Uh, when I built Bertrophin's uh, Cambridge office, called Genzyme. Genzyme developed a drug for Gaucher disease, which is a horrific, deadly illness that Genzyme. is, is rapidly Genzyme. fatal. It's a lysosomal storage disorder where one enzyme okay. is malformed. That's a common theme in genetic diseases. I'll talk about like my disease, BCAM, where, where that enzyme is malformed. So anyway, um, in, in Gaucher disease, there's, there's only a few thousand people with this illness in the world. And Genzyme had the idea that they would charge $350,000 for the drug. Um, Nobody complained. Um, if you're that dying patient, you're thrilled. It's the best day of your life. Um, if you're an insurer, you say, what's Gaucher disease? Oh, it's a fatal disease. Just pay for it. The patient never pays a dime. It's the, the insurance company doesn't have the heart to charge them a copay. Um, what are you going to do? Ask for a $1,000 copay? It's, it's not fair. So, so that's another thing that people sort of don't understand. Drugs like, like Cerazyme, which is the name of this drug, and drugs like Daraprim are covered by insurance. Nobody gets a bill for $750. Nobody is asking you to, to pony up your life savings, and we'll see that more clearly in a minute. 
So what was amazing about uh, the Genzyme story is that it, it ushered in this new world. There's another Cambridge company, a lot of these are Cambridge companies, called uh, Biogen that developed the, the first drug for MS called Interferon Beta. And Biogen proved to Pfizer, Merck, and Johnson & Johnson that that old price time sales, price times volume equals sales calculation, that companies like Pfizer and Merck that would laugh at multiple sclerosis and laugh at these orphan diseases. I'll never forget the day I met a senior executive at J&J who literally said, when I, I told him that I was, I was a young orphan drug company, he said, cry me a river. Orphan drugs are like when a, a kid falls down a well. The whole town gets there and tries to save the kid, but I'm here to develop drugs for diabetic nephropathy and Alzheimer's and serious illnesses. Well, if it was your kid, it, it'd be serious to you too. And these are illnesses. You might know somebody with MS. You might know somebody, I know three people who died of multiple myeloma, CML, and other diseases. And the only way to make these diseases worth treating um, from a financial perspective, from an ethical perspective, they're always worth treating. But unless you, unless you can charge a lot per patient, there just aren't that many of these patients out there that have these illnesses. There's a million people with rheumatoid arthritis, but there's only 5,000 people with CML. And even for rheumatoid arthritis, a million was just on the border of what a drug company would be interested in years, 20, 30 years ago. Today, everything's different. So how do we price drugs? What's a good idea? I mean, I like this idea, which is that price should be equivalent to value. Um, that the value of something and its price should approximate each other and that we shouldn't take into consideration things like, you know, do we like the CEO? Or what was the price yesterday before the price was corrected for its value? Which, again, I think should be irrelevant. If the price yesterday of a good re restore that price to a normal value, the way I look at it is that everyone was getting a free ride before. Not that this is now uh, price gouging. It's price gouging if it's above its fair value. If, it's, if you're charging a lot for a good, it, and it's an unfair price, that it's not providing its value, then, then I think there's, there's something wrong with that. And in general, you're, you will not succeed. So a good example is a heart attack, which costs, say, $100,000 to, to, to treat. I mean, it's an arbitrary number, I'm not totally sure. And if you had a drug that, that saved 10% of heart attacks, it would be reasonable to charge $10,000. We have a lot of shenanigans going on here. Um, so I think there's a lot of pros to this. You know, it's, it's utilitarian, it encourages a um, uh, a fair um, market, it rewards incentives, it, it provides a lot of great things. Unbelievably, patients, physicians, and payers agree with this. I have never gotten a call so from an insurance company saying your drug prices are too high. And we'll talk about that in, in a minute too. The cons are that if, if there are changes that correct the value of something, they can often be a positive. I'll, I'll go really fast. So this is a drug that we use the Daraprim profits to, to make a new Daraprim. And it works a lot better. It's safe. Um, Dr. Welsh sat next to me at Turing, and we hope this drug replaces Daraprim. It's a much safer, better medicine. There are a lot of flaws to single payer. I talk a lot about this stuff. Um, I did not do this over the last 60 years. We want to spend more on healthcare. It's not an accident. It's not a recent phenomenon. It's not my fault. Um, physicians and hospitals are the largest cost to our healthcare system, not drugs. We get a lot of the flack for it. But um, you mean like ACA, at medical school, I asked those guys to take a pay cut. Um, they didn't love that. Um, the present value of being a doctor is pretty high. Um, it's a $2 million trade. You spend $50,000 a year for four years, and you make an extra $100,000 a year for life. That's a good deal. Um, so only 600 people pay for Daraprim. Their insurance covers it, and the copay is 20 bucks. 1,400 people get it for free. I wish no one got it for free. but. The rules are that they get it for free. And again, if anybody can't get the drug, I just met my second patient since I started, since I raised the price of the that couldn't get it. The second guy. And uh, both times there were patients that were, they might've been undocumented and they didn't want to necessarily go through all the hoops to, to get the medicine and we needed to sort of improvise, if you will, to get them the drug. Daraprim happens to have a different patient population than most. So it's partially why we have to give away so much medicine. And we also have to make sure that we make some money on the 600 patients. So the, the net price for one, I've lost this quickly, but for one course of Daraprim, it is roughly $20,000. Um, and it's curative. You only have to take it for 40 days. Every other medicine, you're taking for life. So the fact that you take 40 days of Daraprim makes it, it ends up making it a really cheap drug and an efficient drug. So, um, and nobody doesn't get the drug, so um, the idea that the murder is a little strange. 
So I'm the best. Um, and, uh, this is why um, I saved this kid's life. Uh, I read the news story and you know basically just jumped into action to make sure that through back couriers and rural Venezuela, this kid could get the medicine. And if you want to read the story, uh, Karina did a great job documenting our odyssey to save one guy's life. This is my disease. I, I say that not because I have it, but because I know almost everyone that does. Pecan is a disease that I studied this very carefully and I realized that if I could replace, pank is mal malformed in pecan, if I could replace phosphopenylphenate, I could save these kids' lives. Um, I did that, I won two US patents for it. Um, this is how the drug works. Um, Dr. Vino and Mr. Biestek aren't here, so I, I will say that I did 95% of this work. <laughs> My friend Kevin here will testify to that, he was there too. Um, the drug's in phase three, we'll see if it's the real McCoy. It might be, it might not be. Um, these kids' lives depend on it. Ty, Tanner, and Lane. Um, the oldest kid is, is very close to death. Um, this is a disease that nobody cares about because 500 people have it. Uh, you can't sell a medicine uh, for 500 people. It's very hard. You have to make that drug very expensive. I talked to Laura quite a lot. We fought with the FDA to get early access to it. We lost. Um, we had to wait an extra six months, and um, we hope that the drug works. We'll see. Uh, talk about some music, okay, yeah. different things like that. Um, do we want to go to Q&A? Um, okay. Um, I, I'm not this like a so crazy, good, crazy person. I love my cat. Um, I've never, I've never taken a lean control, including marijuana cigarettes, which I know many of you. Have. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a nerd at, at heart. Um, so this idea that I'm this flamboyant, you know, playboy, you know, I guess sexual predator as well. Uh, I, I don't know where people get that. I, I don't even leave my house most of the time. I'm kind of a, a hermit. Um, these are the diseases I'm interested in, in treating. Uh, these are the, some of the, the um, some of the great um, advances I'm looking forward to in the next sort of five, ten years, fifteen years. That I think will happen. Um, there's some really cool stories about medicine here. <laughs> this is a That's deep information. Uh, this is hey, a deep crazier one where you can't feel pain, and these are inspiration yeah, for you. All the new new potential therapies. I think CRISPR is. Uh, I think weed is. Uh, from a what? from a pharmaceutical <laughs> perspective, uh, I, don't, I don't think we cures cancer. Um, pretty sure I'd bet anything on that. Um, I have a solution for high drug prices. I think Trump should start a drug company. Um, I think that basically, if if we're so outraged by these big drug price spikes, the government can step in and guarantee. My Republican friends will hate this, but they'll they can guarantee that generic drugs will be supplied without price increases. We do have a problem with generic drugs. Um, I've taken advantage of the problem, whether you love me or hate me for that is up to you, but I always make sure that the money goes to the right place and that the patients can always get the drug. But there is a solution to this. I'd be proud to, to help implement this since it's such an important need and there's so much outcry. Let's just do it. Um, and I think that the state-owned enterprise has worked in China. It's worked in, in other countries. It's not a bad thing for the government to run a company. It just has to be done right. Um, we have Fannie Mae. We have Freddie Mac. Um, there are ways to run, have a private, private public partnership. It's, it's not easy, but it's possible. Um, the government should also run an insurer. Um, they do something like that. Um, insurance companies profit from inflation. This is an income statement of an average insurer. Uh, you can see their income in 2021. If there's 5% inflation, they make 1.1 billion. If there's 1% inflation, they make 900 million. Insurers love price increases. I've never been um, called up and, and asked, Martin, why did you raise the price of this drug? I'm pretty sure they love it because they make wow. more money. And mm -hmm. if we all agree that's a bad thing, and I'm pretty sure it's a bad thing, if the fox is guarding the hen house, sure you know, we should have someone who's independent. There used to be, this is a member berry. Um, <laughs> people, uh, <laughs> member, member Blue Cross Blue Shield. This Blue Cross Blue Shield used to be that. In 1994, they sold out. And... There's no more Blue Cross Blue Shield. The name exists, but now it's just for for-profit insurers. Which, so basically the Fox and the Hen House met in 1994, and ever since then there's been runaway healthcare costs. I don't think that's an accident. And I think very, very few people know this. Um, so, with respect to politics, I don't know if these protesters know this stuff. I'm pro-affirmative action, I'm pro-choice, I'm pro-feminist. Um, gay investors built all of my, my, my companies, believe it or not. Um, I'm pro-Planned Parenthood. I've given so much money to Democrats. 
I don't know if this makes me a Republican, but after the, you know, the last election, I, I think I am. But I, I just think, you know, a lot of people don't appreciate this. Um, so I have a couple of slides left. This is the true love, uh, Lauren Duca. Uh, and uh, that's it. Uh, I'll skip these two slides. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.